Welcome back to Golf Smarter Mulligans number 34. I'm Fred Green. If you've yet to hear last week's episode, number 33, then please check that out first, as this is part two of an interview from 2006 that was about an hour long, so I cut it into two parts for you. Our guest is Michael Murphy, author of the most famous and probably most revered golf novel in history, Golf in the Kingdom. We open this conversation getting his thoughts on whether the young, powerful, and popular tour players of... 2006 were possibly influenced by the Zen element of golf. Again, I also want to remind you that you really owe it to yourself if you're a golfer to read Golf in the Kingdom. And if you have read it and can't stop thinking about it, I get it. Please check out Shivas Iron Society at shivas.org, S H I V A S dot org. Golf Smarter Mulligans is brought to you by Two Guys with Golf Balls. Dot com. I'm telling you, you can go to all the stores you want, and you're not going to find better prices. Even if you go to the big box stores, you're not going to find better prices on golf balls than twoguyswithgolfballs.com. Think about the number of balls that you go through in a season. And if you're lucky like me, you can play golf 12 months a year, eh, maybe nine and a half, eh, maybe 11 months a year. <laughs> but my point is, you go through a lot of balls in one year. You really do. You don't. You don't end up with the with balls left over in in the box that you bought at the beginning of the season. I don't know if that's possible with anybody. Some, you know, unless of course you're on the tour and there's people lining the fairways showing you exactly where your balls are flying out. But you need to buy golf balls. That's why I want you to go to twoguyswithgolfballs.com because you're going to save a tremendous amount of money. And if you need help picking a ball that's right for your game, write to them. Go to twoguyswithgolfballs.com and ask Sam. Then when you make that purchase, use Golf Smarter when you're checking out to get an additional 10% off. And you'll get that discount every time you shop with every order. It's not just limited to a one-time thing, but it does expire on April 1st, 2020. That's two guys with golf balls. Dot com. Mulligans is also brought to you by Autoslash.com. Autoslash.com, the magic hack that saves you money the next time you want to rent a car. It's that simple. You have to rent a car when you're traveling. Most of the time, you know, a lot of people are still, they're, they're now doing Uber and Lyft and they're doing stuff like that. But if you're traveling with your family or you have to pick people up, you know, sometimes you just need to have a car when you go somewhere else. You want that freedom. Well, that can get expensive, but not if you use autoslash.com. So the next time you reserve a car, let Autoslash know about it, and they're going to keep an eye on that price for you because car rental price changes happen all the time. They've got to unload the stuff that's sitting in their parking lots, so they're going to change the price on a daily basis. And you know, like if there's a big convention or there's some big event going on in that city, the prices are going to go up, but they're going to fluctuate and they're going to drop. And the average user of Auto Slash saves 30% from when they originally booked the car. So you need to check it out the next time you're going to travel, the next time you're going to book a car, go to autoslash.com, A-U-T-O, S-L-A-S-H, autoslash.com. All right, we're back with Michael Murphy, the author of Golf in the Kingdom and the Kingdom of Shiva's Irons and In the Zone, among others. And uh, we're, again, Michael, very appreciative that you give us our time to talk about this stuff. You, one of the things that fascinates me is there's a new generation of golfers. They're hitting the ball very far. They're not necessarily focused on the strategy of a golf course or how to read the features of a golf course. Is it a surprise to you or not that two names that are the biggest in the young studs coming up in the game are Michelle Wee and Tiger Woods, both with, um, let's say, Asian roots and could get more in the metaphysical part of this? Well, that's a... That's a very, very interesting uh, question. Uh, you know, I wonder uh, about them both, uh, whether or not this, you know, we, we, whether or not we're projecting the Buddhism onto them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But Be- I, because but- both of them obviously have um, 
some temperamental advantages. I, I haven't watched uh, Michelle Wee uh, play. I've seen her, you know, you can't miss her, mm-hmm. swinging in ads and in, in, in little short subject things. But you you can look at her. Here she is. What is she, 16? Yeah. Uh, but Tiger I follow. The only reason these days I watch golf tournaments is if Tiger's in contention. I, I'm the exact same thing. Yeah, I, I somehow can't get interested unless he's in contention. But so I've... Because he's in contention so much, I uh, have watched him a lot, and uh, definitely have a feeling for his temperament. His mother uh, being Thai and Chinese, and I believe Buddhist, mm-hmm. um, is said to have had some influence on him that way, and it's possibly true. Uh, I, but I've never really heard anywhere that he has any uh, sustained meditation practice well i can't imagine that it came from his marine's father yeah but well, but <laughs> uh, more and more as i've studied these things through the years and this is the reason i started esalen institute and uh, the reason i've written all these books uh, is to understand the further reaches of the human potential and this developmental process by which we can enter into a richer and richer consciousness and greater and greater physical capacity in any field. But in sport and in other fields like this, where there is not a formal practice, it's what I'm calling these days covert practice. That is, where you are practicing uh, to the end of your pursuit. Um, It could be a sport. It could be a profession. It could be... uh, uh, just in part of your life to perfect a relationship. But somehow you have dedicated yourself to this over time and willy-nilly it becomes a practice with a lot of resemblance to the great contemplative yogic relig- religious practices. That is, you have to give up a lot of your old stuff. The principle of sacrifice which, you know, the root of sacrifice is to make sacred. But it means giving things up. Now, let's say uh, in golf, uh, giving up all these destructive thoughts when you stand up to the ball. The game has an absolute genius um, uh, to and perversity to bring out these awful thoughts <laughs> and these... Uh, violent emotions that must be contained just to hit the ball, let alone hit it straight. So, that practice uh, to, uh, for equanimity, for focus, to, or to visualize your shot um, has to be uh, developed and is if you play the game wholeheartedly. Now, with both um, uh, Tiger and Michelle, apparently, um, this seems to be uh, aided by this native equanimity they seem to exhibit. You know, you look at their facial uh, facial features and all that. Now, it could be our, our projection into them, but um, and then there you have to just say that they're athletically uh, supremely gifted, both of them, and they've had these... Uh, driven parents I mean Earl Woods you know with Tiger starting when he was two and uh, Michelle Wee with her parents starting when she was uh, a child Um, and um, so I don't know whether it's related to the fact of their you know eastern background and their possible connections to the Buddhist world I don't know Hmm. Uh, but it is certainly uh, a, a plausible it's possible. Well, you know, Michelle and Tiger are great for the future of the golf business. Amen. You know? but That's for sure. But what about role models left uh, to teach the Chivas Irons approach to the game? Well, you know... uh, Is that going to get lost? Yes. Well, no, there are such... You know, uh, Freddie Shoemaker, the uh, wonderful teacher, he uh, 
you know, he he is that way. He's a member of the Shiva's Iron Society. Yes, he is. He has uh, his own following, his own school, his own books. Extraordinary mm. golf. Extraordinary golf and extraordinary putting. And we had Fred on the show just last week. Yeah, and uh, the uh, Glenn Albaugh, who has coached a number of uh, top uh, professional players like Scotty McCarron. And, now, uh, there's there's great stories about you and Glenn. All you know, you guys go way back, right? Well, we went, to, you know, the grammar school together. I sat and listened. I, w- I was the literal fly on the wall the other night at the Shivas Iron Society event, <laughs> where the two of you were just reminiscing about years and years and years together, and it was a joy for me. Well, it was. Uh, he he is a wonderful, wonderful human being, and uh, uh, anybody who is coached by Glenn is is a lucky person, uh, and uh, he's so. And he has used uh, golf in the kingdom as a text, uh, and uh, so the point I want to make here is that the book has found its way uh, into the world of golf instruction in sports psychology generally. And uh, now, sports psychology, you know, itself has mushroomed. And, um, you know, different teachers operate at different levels. You have swing coaches, you know, the famous ones that we all know about, uh, you know, uh, the ones that uh, Tiger has turned to. Then you have your mainstream sports psychologists, uh, like, say, Bob Rotella, Mm -hmm. who uh, works with your emotions, your attitudes, your motives. And then you have um, a third group that are in not only to the into the mastery of the inner game, but the further reaches of these altered states. Uh, let's call it the mystical side. And Glenn is in is enters that world, and Freddie Sh- Shoemaker does. Um, so the golf instruction is co-evolving with the game itself. It's an interesting the way the game. First of all, the um, the equipment is evolving, you know, the clubs Absolutely. and the balls. The instruction is evolving. The understanding of consciousness of the game is evolving, and Golf in the Kingdom has played uh, a large catalytic role in that. And then golf course design itself is evolving. Uh, Robert Trent Jones, uh, uh, Jr., uh, wrote a book, uh, golf, uh, uh, golf by Design. Golf by Design, Talking, for example, about illusion, <laughs> the the Dharma combat of the architect versus the golfer to set up illusions that uh, you have to see your way through, where you can't judge distance as well, and so forth, and then the design of beauty and of what they call shot value. Um, if you play some of these beautiful courses, you come away enhanced. It's it's just so rich. Um, these really are the world's largest gardens. Oh, my gosh. 150 to 200 acres each. There are 25,000 of them now uh, in the world, 15,000 or more in America. And the care and feeding of golf courses, it's incredible. And, you know, you talk about the great gardens of the European royalty, say at Versailles. Well, I mean... These, you know, 15,000 of them, and some of them are just unforgettable. Absolutely. And you play out there, and you play, let's say uh, on, a, on a late uh, night in June, and everything, the, it's starting to freshen up, and suddenly, you know, it's, the air is lighter again, and there's some moisture in the air, and uh, the sun is set, and you're, it's what the Celts call playing in the gloaming. Um, you're suffused with this beauty. Um, I'll never forget um, this woman. She wrote to me. She said she was playing up the the 18th hole of one of these great golf courses down on the Monterey Peninsula, and the sun was setting. And um, as she played out on the 18th, the sun set completely, but she realized that the sun was shining through the ground. And she went into the clubhouse, and it was still shining, and it shined for three days afterwards, and she lived in the gloaming for three days. Mm. Now, that is a real mystical experience by someone who had, it was very illiterate 
about mystical literature. But she, she wanted to ask me about this extraordinary experience. Was it caused because her retina had been stimulated by the sun? You know, there was probably her husband tried to talk her out of the experience. But in any case, isn't that an amazing thing? It's absolutely and, amazing. And I think that uh, a large percentage of people who play golf have these kinds of experiences. Everyone, I think every golfer has some of it. Um, and to the extent that they can absorb the experience, um, then it stays with them. It resonates afterwards. It's a very sensuous game. You know, a lot oh, of people my. think of golf as... Not a sensuous game, but it is extremely sensuous because you have to make these swings, you know, which release all these neuropeptides, some of which are called opioid peptides, into your bloodstream. You get high on this. Now, it can be interfered with by all the cursing and failed shots and shanks and, you know, all well, the, the frustration. The of... frustration, all the flotsam and jetsam of your golfing unconscious can float up to the surface, you know. So, um, but to the extent that you can get past all that and play the game with this equanimity, then you can experience the sensuous side. And um, that woman's description, uh, imagine that. The sun had gone down, but now the sun was shining through the ground. Mm. And in the clubhouse, afterward, mm. it, shined, it was shining, and it was shining three days later. Wow. And she was in a state, and... Um, so reading Golf in the Kingdom gave her a context for this, because Golf in the Kingdom is about these kinds of states, you know. Um, uh, when the book first came out in 72, a, a man named Jim Benepe, his son actually was on the tour. Uh, I think he's the father of the same younger Jim Benepe. But in any case, I had met this older Jim Benepe, and he uh, said, Mike, uh, true gravity... Uh, Shiva Sirens, the protagonist of the book, talks about true gravity. He says, is this what it is? He said, I was playing the 18th hole um, on my a course I love. It's a long uphill five par, and I, somehow your book got me into a state, and I was shooting the best score I had ever shot on this course. And I came to the 18th hole, and for the first time in my life, I hit, uh, I hit it in two, uh, two shots. And... Um, he said, as, as I was walking up this long uphill fairway, I suddenly felt as if I was walking downhill. And it was such an intense experience that I suddenly remembered your thing about true gravity. Is this what true gravity meant? Well, that was the first report I ever got from somebody about that phenomenon. Since, I've gotten uh, dozens of reports of this reversal of gravity. Um, and... Um, I could go on and on about the different kinds of altered states that people get into, but um, uh, that's, again, uh, the kind of thing that can get triggered by this crazy game. It seems that golf has more participants as they grow older and mature. Do you think that has some impact on the fact that as we get older and as we get wiser and we surrender to the forces that are out of our control because you know when you're young and you're playing those kind of sports that require much more physicality right um you don't really have time to think about it where on a golf course you do and again you're maturing yeah i think that's a ve that's a very good point i i don't know the percentages now of uh, the different age groups that play the game but uh it certainly is as you get older uh and there's less adrenaline and less testosterone, as we produce less of the fight and flight response mm -hmm. and more of, um, and learn to get a little more control of our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems and parasympathetic, the one to relax us. Um, yeah, I think you're right that you're capable of a more, a deeper, more sensuous, lasting enjoyment. Um, and, uh, you know, in that way, it resembles uh, sexual activity. Uh, you know, young guys, it, you know, bam, bam, thank you, ma'am, <laughs> when you're in your late teens. But as you get older, I mean, you know, if you still enjoy uh, sex, there, there can be this, that it's, it, it's more time for dilation and, you know, uh, openness. I think all life 
can be that way if you stay healthy and if you enter into life fully that um, it becomes deeper and richer and more sensuous and more open and um, it can be and that's one of the you know the great promises of all the contemplative practices and yogic practices and of, of sport and of course golf you can play all your life too I mean you can you know you can't and shouldn't play football all your life <laughs> or even basketball yeah I mean well, you know, the arthritis and the right. muscle pulls and, you know, each body can only uh, do so many, um, you know, jumps and hop, skips and jump, you know. But golf, you can uh, you can play into your, you know, all your life. And maybe because it's a, part- a participatory sport that you can go through for most of your life like you know, bowling too but <laughs> there's not enough time to contemplate anything in bowling there's just so much activity everywhere and so much noise yeah but i think this is what separates golf from other sports is the fact that you can play it your whole life right i mean there are a number of things a uh, golf you know i had no idea golf had as many of these dimensions uh that as it does when i wrote that book I had played golf. I started, you know, relatively late, I think, to be a good player, but I started at 14, and in two years I got it down to a four handicap and played uh, Kenny Venturi in the finals of uh, the Northern California Junior Championship, the president's flight. That is, if everybody... I was only 16, he was only 15. Anyway, I played... Anyway, I got good fast. You know, I, I have a feeling for it over a lifetime, the game. And... um um, having taken up running in middle age, it's, uh, these other sports are, are limited in, in, um, for a lifetime. And golf has a, is great that way. Well, golf also has, has a social aspect to it. What do you think yes. it is about golf that yes. lends itself to not only conversation, yes. but the uh-huh. deepening of friendships? Yes, it does. It, uh, you're absolutely right. And, um, you know, golf writers have been celebrating that for since the 18th century, Tom Watson said, you know, after five holes of golf with someone, you know practically everything you want to know or should know about someone. <laughs> and and you can learn a lot about how somebody conducts business by watching them on a golf amen. course. Uh, amen. Amen. Uh, uh, we do reveal ourselves in golf. I had the somebody in Golf in the Kingdom say, nowhere does a man go so naked as he does all dressed for golf (laughs) why do we love to watch a ball in flight what is it about that little white ball that we just love to get up in the air and stare at it whether you're watching your own or you're watching it on TV yeah it's just well I had a lot of uh, I call you know the second half of uh, golf in the kingdom I sometimes called um, gonzo metaphysics after Hunter Thompson's uh, <laughs> gone, so uh, but I had fun with it. It, um, you know, these archetypes that get traced like filigrees of light against the sky, you know, in the flight of the ball, and how this could remind us of uh, deep dimensions of the way we're built and how it could relate to you know the fact that we love to um throw things and how you know if we hadn't thrown things uh the homo sapiens sapiens wouldn't have evolved because that gave us an advantage over so many um of the animals we had to combat with or hunted whether these were rocks or spears or whatever and um throwing things. We love baseball. We love football. We love the forward pass in football. We love these balls headed out. So part of it are uh, our hunting pass. There's something in our destiny, you know, um, that's outward bound. And golf is a little mini version of it. Um, It opens up our secret imagination to these possibilities that's you know to, uh, one reason we love these long towering drives you know and or being able to shape a shot you know to fade it or to draw it uh so you paint these filigrees against the sky it's 
It's amazing. It really is. You know, there are books that that don't lend themselves to the silver screen, to the big screen, but they end up there anyway. <laughs> they shouldn't have been in the first place. Yeah. But I think Golf in the Kingdom is so visual in so many ways. Well, you know, it's God. It's been thirty-four years. I've uh, uh, there's somebody been making a movie about this thing for, for all thirty-four years. Oh, is that right? I've sold seventeen options. Warner Brothers uh, owned it for ten years for Clint Eastwood. <clears throat> no one's figured out how to make it. Wow. Um, so at times I wonder whether. Uh, Clint Eastwood couldn't figure out how it can be done. Sean Connery, who loved the book, I played golf uh, with him once, and he he had, he was feeling at that time it just couldn't be done. It's too special a book. Hmm. Although he thought, you know, to give it a try. No one's done it, and maybe it can't be done. I don't know. So who would you want to play Michael Murphy in the movie? Uh, well, uh, God, uh, no one I've met. I wouldn't want to wish that on anyone. <laughs> <laughs> but who would you want to play? Now, you say Sean Connery. He'd be, would he be a great Chivas Irons? Well, uh, yeah, uh, he, of course. Uh, he'd oh, be my. great at anything he wanted to do. But <clears throat> it's, um, I don't know. Um, we asked Daniel Day-Lewis to do it, oh. uh, and he said, no, I could see him doing it. Sure. I think he could pull it off, the yeah. Chivas Irons character. Uh, uh, he's, he, he's the best I've seen uh, who fits. For me, someone who could morph into that Shiva Sirens character, uh, Daniel Day Lewis. But uh, he said, uh, just you know, he's Irish uh, ancestry, lives in England. But he, uh, he said his uh, distaste for golf uh, equals that the distaste of his friends for the Catholic Church. Like <laughs> anyway, that's what he said. <laughs> well, hopefully someday uh, we'll we'll get to see something. Um, well, or just keep it in our minds and play yeah. it over in our minds. Well, I like to say, you know, Golf in the Kingdom is um, perhaps the longest-running virtual movie coming soon <laughs> to a mind near yours. <laughs> so, well, anyway, thanks for all of this. and um, well, Thank you, Michael. And, and again, the book is Golf in the Kingdom, The Kingdom of Shiva's Irons, and um, In the Zone, Michael Murphy, uh, we... If I can speak for everybody, uh, thank you for providing us with this kind of literature that really helps well, uh, life I, and, and our game. Well, thanks. This has been a great conversation. Thanks a million. 